Welcome to this uh, ICJ, um, Jerusalem Dispatch, uh, live and interactive uh, program tonight. And uh, tonight we have a very special guest. We also very much appreciate everyone uh, being here today, uh, particularly if we're across the UK. It's uh, it's very hot and we actually have uh, Israeli temperatures right now. So, uh, so thank you for being with us because it is going to be a very special evening tonight. Uh, this month's um, special guest on uh, Jerusalem Dispatch, International Christian Embassy Jerusalem, is uh, a good friend of mine. His name is uh, Step and Silver. He is the son of David Silver from Outer Zion Ministries. So we'll be talking about uh, Stefan's life uh, from his life growing up in New Zealand to making Alia as a child to Israel, to uh, serving in the IDF, to becoming an officer and also then becoming a pastor uh, and is now a, a, a first top class Israeli analyst on Israeli politics and the Middle East. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to uh, Reverend Mark Starbuck, who is the uh, chaplain feast for the International Christian Embassy at Jerusalem. And also he does an absolute fantastic uh, po uh, podcast that uh, is, is definitely worth listening to. So I'm going to hand over to, to Mark to pray for tonight's proceedings. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Simon. Lord, we want to thank you and give you praise. At the very start of this program, we want to bring it to you and say, Lord, we love you, we honor you, we exalt your name. And Lord, we particularly want to pray for Israel at this time, especially during the visit of the American leadership. Would you just grant them favor and grant them that wisdom to know how to just navigate this time. Lord, we thank you for the work of ICJ, this remarkable ministry of comfort, a prophetic Christian voice into the nation. And we pray for their work and that you will bless them and help them. And now, Lord, for our time together with Pastor Stefan, we thank you for him. Thank you for his amazing story, how you've uh, brought him to yourself, how you've used him. And we pray that as we listen and we share tonight, that it'll all be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Simon. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everyone uh, joining us tonight. Just a, a, a reminder that uh, the Feast of Tabernacles is, is live in uh, Israel in three locations in October. Uh, sadly, none of us have been able to attend primarily because of COVID-19. But now is your opportunity to go to Israel and to partake in, in the feast, in which you'll see uh, Mark there as the, uh, as the feast chaplain. So let's have a look at this excellent video uh, produced by ICJ telling us about the beauty that is Israel, but also the excitement surrounding the Feast of Tabernacles. Prophecies are being fulfilled on a daily basis here in the land of Israel. We want to invite you to enter the land where we will take you places you've never seen before.
we so much look forward to seeing you at the Feast of Tabernacles 2022 here in the Land of Promise. Fantastic. Now, if that doesn't get you uh, excited, I don't know what will. Um, Mark, as the chaplain of the feast, uh, and maybe for for some of our our viewers watching tonight who haven't been to Israel or haven't participated in the ICEJ uh, Feast of Tabernacles, can you share with us uh, what they can expect uh, and how special this this annual event is? Well, there are two ways in which you can be involved in the Feast of Tabernacles. The first is just as a pilgrim. Um, I see Jay have a feast tour. You can sign up for it, get hold of Joanne and uh, get the details, and you can go to the feast and participate in the events. Uh, why is that important? Well, you know, we are anticipating a day when Messiah has come, and set up his kingdom, where it says that year by year, they will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And in a sense, we are anticipating that we are coming from all the nations to worship the Lord in Zion. So that in itself is the most amazing and special uh, opportunity. The other way in which you can be involved is by serving at the feast, by becoming a team member. And there are many ways in which you can be involved as an usher, as part of security, catering, IT, media. There are all sorts of ways in which you can be involved. Go up onto the icj.org website, look for the feast, and somewhere there will be a, a mechanism for you to sign up uh, to be a feast team member. Excellent. And, and um, Mark, would you also read out uh, Stefan's uh, impressive biography? I did try and get a more extensive one, but, but Stefan didn't actually give me one. So uh, this is your chance to, uh, to expand yeah, upon yeah. His, uh, his expertise and his knowledge and his giftings that the Lord's given him greatly. Well, let, let, me, let me try and uh, put it together. Stefan Silva was born in Auckland, New Zealand immigrated to Israel in 1992 with his family, now serves as a pastor at Karem El, God's Vineyard, an indigenous, vibrant Hebrew-speaking congregation located in the center of Haifa. He holds an executive MBA from Haifa University and has pioneered two leading media and internal evangelism ministries in Israel, as well as serving with the Out of Zion Ministries. He was also an officer in the IDF and fought against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon in 2008. Stefan is married to his wife, Karen, I think that's correct, or Karen, a Messianic worship leader and recording artist. And together they have three beautiful daughters and they reside in the coastal town or in a coastal town near Haifa, which we discovered is Atlit. So please welcome our special guest tonight, Pastor Stefan Silver. Uh, and, and Stefan, uh, we appreciate you giving up your time. We know there's a two hour time difference. But, but firstly, I want to thank you for the excellent contributions that you've made on the programs we've done together on Revelation TV, the Middle East Report. You've been my recent guest on Behind the Headlines as well. And, and you're a first class analyst. But but you're also a reservist in the Israeli Defense Force as well. So you've got an incredible story to tell. So really appreciate you being here tonight. And for those watching as well, just a reminder that we are live. We are interested interactive so if you want to put a question to stefan uh, you can do so so we'll give like five ten minutes at the end for, for your questions um stefan I'll, I'll start off with you first can you tell us uh, about uh, your your background because you have a famous father in the ministry uh david silver who's uh, coming over to the uk in august because i'm interviewing um yeah. and uh, you were born in new zealand so tell us about how you came to faith in the lord jesus christ uh, and your life growing up in new zealand a long way from israel yeah well first of all just to say thank you simon and uh, mark and everybody else and it's uh, wonderful to be able to be with you all uh here this evening 
uh, and praise God that we can connect uh, in this way. Even all of you in the UK, you can still come together from all over the UK and uh, we can join from other places as well. So uh, it is wonderful uh, to be with you and thank you for having me. Uh, and so, yeah, like uh, like you all said, like my bio uh, read out, um, I was born uh, in New Zealand, uh, far, far away. I think they say that Israel and New Zealand are pretty much opposites on the globe. Uh, I think if you dug from Israel through the core of the earth in a straight diameter down, you come out somewhere in the Pacific Ocean uh, around New Zealand. So it literally is the opposite side of the earth. Um, not only geographically, but really in every other way as well. Uh, and so, uh, you know, culture, language, climate, cuisine, um, the alphabet, the, the direction that you read and write in, the side of the road that you drive on, everything is, is completely uh, the opposite. Uh, and so for me, uh, being born in New Zealand, which is obviously a, a nation which is very similar to the UK in terms of uh, culture and, and language and, and uh Weather, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit less rainier and uh, gloomy than uh, than the UK is, um, but but nonetheless, relatively uh, similar in, in that regard. And so, uh, definitely, uh, growing up in New Zealand for the first almost eight years of my life, um, coming from a, a believing home, uh, going to a private Christian school uh, in my first few years uh, in New Zealand, uh, first three years, I think, of school was, was in a, a Christian school. Uh, and so things were done in a very, very different way than they are in the public schools here in any kind of school here, uh, to be honest. Um, and, and so that uh, change and that move in 1992 was obviously a very, very uh, uh, drastic change, uh, very traumatic uh, in many ways, I would say, even, um, you know, for a, for a family. My parents were in their late 30s. Uh, it was myself and my younger brother. I was almost eight. My younger brother was uh, just off, uh, he was three and a half, I think. Uh, and to really uproot a family like that and to be replanted over in the, the Middle East where everything is completely different. We didn't know any Hebrew. We didn't know anyone. We didn't know anything. Um, we thought maybe that we knew. Maybe my parents thought that they knew because they had been on tour a couple of times uh, before and in the two preceding years. Uh, but, but really, I think when we got there, we just discovered that we didn't know anything. Um, and within two, even less, uh, one month, uh, maybe a little bit more than maybe five weeks, I found myself in a public Israeli school uh, in one of the worst uh, socioeconomic areas in the greater Haifa area in a place called Kiryat Yam. Uh, we moved into an absorption center. So we came from a beautiful uh, two-story uh, home, a standalone home with a big garden and a double garage. And my brother and I had our own rooms and there was a spare room and there was a living room and a family room and a dining room and all these all these uh, rooms <laughs> in this house. And we moved into this tiny uh, I think it was, I don't remember what the size was. It was probably something like 50 square meters. I mean, something very, very small. I think you guys do it in square feet. Uh, I don't know what that would be. Maybe 500 square feet. Maybe that's even too much. I don't know. Um, very, very small about 50, about 50 square meters. Um, and, and, uh, in a big building with all other immigrant families, I think we were the only family that spoke English. Uh, the rest were all uh, Russian speaking because we immigrated in 92. So that was really the almost the, the peak, those peak years of immigration from the former Soviet Union after the Iron Curtain had come down uh, in 89, uh, beginning end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. And there was a flood of, of immigration coming from all over Eastern Europe back to the land of Israel. Uh, and that's what um, was done back then before the age of internet, before the age of Google Street View, uh, before the age of Airbnb and all kinds of other uh, niceties that we have today that make life easier. Uh, you would just come to Israel, you would land at Ben Gurion, you would get uh, fill up some papers with the Jewish agency, and then you would uh, roll on over to an absorption center. Uh, which looks probably more or less like a like a prison does in the in Western countries, uh, and then you just kind of find your own way from there. There's you know there's some help uh, here and there, uh, sending you to Olpan to learn some Hebrew and maybe helping you with some uh, vocational um, uh, searches, uh, looking for a job or whatnot. Uh, but that was pretty much our life for the first uh, nine months uh, in Israel. Uh, we were right on the beach, which was a nice thing. 
but really the area was was very very uh downridden uh very uh und- underdeveloped uh, especially coming from uh, new zealand especially coming from the life that we knew uh there um israel has changed a lot in the past uh, 30 years and actually just uh, on sunday our family uh, together with my brother and his wife and uh, his uh, daughter my parents and my family we're all going to celebrate uh 30 years of being in the country um, which uh, is next week. Uh, no, sorry, the week after next, but we're celebrating next week. I think it's on July 28th is the actual uh, anniversary. So That's God has cool. been, thank you. <laughs> God has been good. It hasn't always <laughs> been easy, um, but this is the, the process of what he is doing uh, and, and our family. And, and that story is maybe just a, just a glimpse, a micro uh, uh, story of, of many other families and what God is doing around the world, bringing the Jewish people back home uh, to the land of Israel. Yeah. Now, m- most of our viewers will know that anyone who is a, a child or a teenager in Israel has to uh, join the Israeli Defense Force, which is compulsory. I think it's three years for men and two and a half years for women. Um, so, share w- what that experience was like f- for you, Stefan. You you you, uh, you you qualified from from high school, and then you were drafted to the IDF. Was there any particular area of the IDF that you wanted to go in? The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and uh, and, and where were you placed once you signed up? Yeah, so I was uh, very motivated to serve in the IDF. Um, I think just the the guys that I hung out with, my friends, uh, everybody was uh, quite motivated to serve uh, in the in the most. Um, combat positions they could get to uh, and the most leading positions they could find themselves in. Uh, in Israel, there's a, a process in which uh, uh, the IDF um, pre-selects uh, high school students based on their initial uh, data that they receive in interviews and, and from the state and whatnot about uh, about the, the different candidates uh, and then send them to um, uh, various uh, testings and kind of physical uh, uh, tests, uh, kind of like hell weeks is what they call them, I think, over in the States, um, uh, testing them to see their adaptability and and how well they would be suited to different uh, units. Um, so I did, a, I did a tryout for the Navy SEALs, uh, but that didn't work out. That was a pretty tough, grueling uh, experience. Uh, my dream really ultimately, though, was to go to flight school and to be a pilot in the uh, Israeli Air Force. Uh, and I got to the, I, I finished the final stage of, of a long uh, process of uh, testing, uh, which culminated kind of in a, in a one week um, uh, physical uh, testing down in the, in the desert by Beersheba, by the Khatsrim uh, Air Force Base. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't selected at the end of that. Uh, and so that was, uh, that was pretty devastating for me. Uh, but I, uh, you know, I'd, I'd grown up as a believer in a believing home and I had a, uh, a, a I would say a, a good relationship with God and, and, uh, knew his word. And so I kind of surrendered that to him and said, not my will be done, but your will be done, even though I really don't like it. And, uh, I ended up, uh, finding myself in the combat engineering corps. Uh, and so the combat engineering corps is a, is a unit, uh, in the IDF. Uh, in the army uh, sector of the uh, IDF, not the Navy or the Air Force, uh, which deals with uh, explosives and demolitions, um, infantry work and all kinds of uh, things like that. These days, they also deal with all of the uh, underground infrastructure, uh, tunnels and um, and other uh, threats uh, as such, both in Lebanon and in Gaza and also in, uh, in uh, the, the West Bank, in uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, take care of usually uh, demolishing um, uh, munitions, uh, houses of terrorists, uh, all kinds of uh, things like that. So I was drafted in uh, 2002, November of 2002. I went through uh, a year of training uh, to become a a fully qualified uh, combat soldier. After that, I went for a four-month course to become an NCO, a non-commissioned officer. And then immediately after that, I went on to an eight-month um, officers training course. Uh, and at the end I was, uh, I became a, I was given the rank of a second Lieutenant. Uh, and my first posting was in a, a far before the uh, operating, uh, post or base, uh, inside Ramallah, uh, back in, uh, this would have been, uh, November of 2004. Uh, so back then, uh, the situation with, uh, you know, just with Ramallah and, and all of that area of Judea and Samir is very, very different than what it is today. 
Uh, today, there's a, a, either a wall or an indicative uh, smart fence that runs around pretty much the, the perimeter of the entire West Bank. Uh, back then, there was absolutely nothing. There was no division whatsoever, no divider whatsoever between um, between uh, Palestinian land uh, or Palestinian areas and, and Israeli areas. So there was really just a free flow of people uh, to and fro uh, in both directions. Uh, and that's what led to a lot of the, uh, obviously, the terrorism uh, that was coming out of the West Bank, uh, both in the 90s and in the 2000s. Uh, and that's when it kind of started to change. And then towards the end of the 2000s, um, then, then the wall and the indicative fence was uh, was uh, erected around that area. So that, that was my first posting. And from there, we were in uh, other sectors such as uh, Ramallah um, or other areas around Ramallah uh, and then uh, Bethlehem and then up on the northern border as well. Uh, and so there was kind of a rotation between uh, those different sectors that we served in. Hmm. And um, Stefan, can you tell us uh, what happened on the 12th of July um, 2006 uh, and how this not only changed your life, but also changed Israeli lives pretty much forever? Yeah, so three weeks uh, before that already, on uh, June 25th, 2006, uh, Gilad Shalit was uh, was uh, captured by uh, by Palestinian uh, militants down uh, through a tunnel uh, in a cross-border raid down near uh, Kerem Shalom, uh, just again uh, opposite uh, Gaza. And so the situation was already uh, very tense. Uh, I think at the time, all eyes were actually looking south. There wasn't a lot of uh, thought about anything happening on the northern border. Uh, everything was, everybody was looking south. We were actually, my unit and I were already en route uh, to take up assignments down in Gaza as the situation uh, developed. Uh, we had already been down there uh, with our officers to learn the sector, to be briefed about what was going on in the sector and what the plans were going ahead. And then we were actually situated up on the uh, or based up on the Golan Heights, and we were we were getting ready the following week to move down to Gaza. When uh, indeed, like you said, on July twelfth, uh, a detachment of uh, Hezbollah terrorists um, they infiltrated Israel from the northern border. They attacked a Humvee patrol convoy, convoy that was uh, patrolling the uh, border. And uh, they abducted uh, two soldiers. They killed, uh, I believe it was all of the rest of the soldiers that were in the, the convoy, um, abducted two soldiers. They were, they were probably either dead when they were taken or they died shortly after. They were returned several years later uh, in, in uh, caskets. Uh, but they were most likely dead uh, when they were abducted. Um, and, and that is basically the, uh, the spark or or the, the eruption that, that caused the Second Lebanon War to flare up uh, for the coming month. And um, Stefan, I mean, I, I was fighting the media war uh, while you're actually fighting the uh, ground offensive. So it, it was my job here to uh, explain exactly what was going on to the British press. Um, so I was working with uh, all the all the main journalists from the national newspapers showing that the Iranians were behind Hezbollah. So I got front page news story in the Sun newspapers and others just to take the heat off Israel and yeah. to explain to the British public and the world's media really what was going on. Uh, and even from that point of view, from a journalistic point of view, that was tough. But to actually be there in southern Lebanon, that was something else. So can you share with us, because um, I know you shared this with me on the Middle East report and it's absolutely inspirational, um, how God protected uh, you and uh, your unit supernaturally? Yeah, so the really the Second Lebanon War was unlike uh, anything that I had ever experienced uh, until then in my military service uh, and not since then either really at all, not in the rest of the military service that I did, which was only a few months and then I was released uh, and not in anything else that I've experienced uh, in my life either. You know, up until then we had, uh, like I said, been on several uh, tours of duty on the northern border. We had experienced some uh, some uh, events that took place up there. Uh, we had um, uh, obtained or uh, um, prevented uh, terrorist attacks from coming out of the, the Judea and Samaria, um, uh, suicide bombers, bomb belts and cars. All these things that we had been involved in, uh, arresting uh, terrorists, you know, in the middle of the night in their, their houses uh, in, in one of the uh, cities down there. Uh, but never really could I say that I felt that my life was was in danger. Never, never really could I say that uh, I, I felt afraid. 
uh, there might have been some moments of adrenaline, but I can't say that I was I was very deeply scared or afraid, uh, nor in a life threatening uh, situation. Uh, I'd never been fired at before, at least not directly. There was some peripheral uh, fire that was uh, going on, but nothing directly directed uh, directly at me uh, or, or any of my soldiers. Um, and then here in, in Lebanon, as we entered into southern Lebanon, uh, which had been prepped for for years uh, by the by Hezbollah, uh, uh, basically filling the place uh, with uh, IEDs, uh, improvised explosive devices, uh, and and just preparing it, knowing that at some point, sooner or later, the IDF would have to enter southern Lebanon again. Uh, and so they had prepared well for that. And so along with all of these explosive devices that were going off in the ground uh, and inside buildings, uh, there was uh, just immense uh, fire coming uh, down upon us, uh, all kinds of different munitions, whether it's um, uh, machine guns, mortars, uh, like I said, explosives in the ground, um, anti-tank missiles, which was one of the main threats of the Southern uh, Second Lebanon War. Um, we, in the Combat Engineering Corps, we have a like a quite a large armored personnel carrier, an APC. It's actually a modified tank that we use in order to maneuver and to travel from place to place. A lot of our heavier equipment uh, is, is carried on that, uh, on that uh, APC. Uh, and so these are very large uh, vehicles that have 12 cylinder turbo diesel engines, big metal tracks, just like you would, you would see in a, in a tank, uh, just without the turret. We have big machine guns on the top, uh, but not, not a turret or, or a cannon. Uh, and so these these machines, they make a lot of noise, they blow out a lot of smoke, they kick up a lot of dust, they're very visible, they're audible, uh, they're not very agile, not very fast either, and they are very uh, convenient targets for anti-tank missiles. Uh, and I can tell you, when an anti-tank missile hits one of these uh, uh, APCs or, or even other vehicles as well, uh, then they really do make a, a nasty uh, mess on the on the other side, especially when there are uh, human beings involved. Uh, and so that was definitely one of the main threats that we were most uh, worried about, concerned about during the Second Lebanon War. And we had these missiles fired at us. Uh, and you know, as as I went into the military, my my relationship with with the Lord was uh, was still uh, strong. But as time went on, I was kind of uh, finding myself in a place where it wasn't that strong uh, anymore. Uh, yet I still believed in God, and I knew that He was uh, alive and real, and He can hear my prayers. And so my prayer was that God would make uh, me and my soldiers uh, invisible during that time. And uh, really, I can say that we. Uh, definitely saw that uh, happening in uh, in the Second Lebanon War, uh, really one to one. Um, the 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 overall uh, conditions of the of the war were not good uh, in Israel's favor. We had uh, Olmert as prime minister, we had uh, Peretz as the minister of defense, and Chalutz as our uh, chief of staff, a pilot who was a bit of an arrogant guy. Uh, and together, they just did not make the, the, the right combination. They made the wrong combination uh, for, for being the, the chiefs who are leading Israel into this, uh, into this war. And so on, on a tactical level, probably up to the level of a, of a division, uh, the soldiers were ready, prepped, <coughs> the units were ready to go uh, and fought well in the field. But because of conflicting orders and, and orders being changed all the time, it created a lot of havoc and, and chaos, uh, and it prevented the, the units from being able to progress and from really even understanding what the, what the mission was, for having that mission crystallized and being able to go after it. Uh, and so that caused uh, issues on the lower levels as well. Uh, of the, the smaller units from the division, the battalion, and then obviously the company and the platoon as well. Uh, and and uh, and caused some confusion there, and 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 things weren't uh, as clear as what uh, we had hoped uh, that they would be. Um, despite that, again, the the threats were the threats, regardless. And uh, and during that time, really, we saw uh, some of these anti tank missiles being fired against our APC. Um, two of them, I remember, actually hit the outside of the APC and fell down <coughs> to the ground. Um, uh, my soldiers actually picked up these uh, paperweight, uh, picked up these pieces of, of uh, copper that usually penetrate the uh, metal of the APCs 
and brought them back to the uh, to our uh, quarters after the war and used them as paperweights in the uh, in our office. Uh, so all kinds of stories like that where really God's protection was uh, definitely supernatural. And uh, briefly, just on this one, can you just share how the uh, your high command were astonished that you didn't have any fatalities or any major injuries within your unit under your command? Yeah, so a friend of mine who was also a, uh, a deputy company commander like myself, during the uh, war, one of my uh, my battalion commander, he had fell over, he hurt his back and he had to be replaced. And uh, during the replacement ceremony, we were talking a number of officers together and uh, one of them, uh, this uh, colleague of mine, he said, Stefan, you know, it's <clears throat> really amazing that uh, neither you or any of your soldiers have been uh, harmed yet by any of these IEDs or uh, anti-tank missiles. Because uh, we had had we had had a few casualties within the battalion, nothing uh, fatal. <clears throat> um, uh, and he said, it's amazing that neither you or any of your soldiers have been hit yet by any of uh, by any of these uh, uh, um, munitions. He said, it's like you guys are absolutely invisible. And so when he when he said that, obviously, he wasn't uh, thinking about it too much. Uh, he was obviously uh, expressing that he was surprised that we hadn't had any fatalities um, because I was specifically uh, praying and asking God that he would make us invisible. Uh, for me, it was a very, very clear confirmation that God was uh, hearing my prayers uh, and he was answering them. Uh, and really, to the end of the, the war, it was uh, th uh, almost a month of actual fighting in southern Lebanon. Uh, and then uh, another few weeks of being still in uh, inside Lebanon while the ceasefire was uh, in place until it was actually finalized. Um, we didn't have any uh, casualties in our uh, unit uh, whatsoever. So uh, all the glory goes to God uh, for that. Amen. Absolutely extraordinary. So there's a lesson for the Israeli High Command. Uh, promote more messianics into the positions of leadership within the Israeli Defence Force and you won't get any casualties or fatalities, which is a, a great story. So thank you so much for sharing that, Stefan. Uh, you're also now still a reservist uh, with the IDF as well, but also one of your big spiritual challenges is that uh, you are a messianic pastor and leader in Israel. Share with us what it's like to be a messianic pastor in the Holy Land. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, something uh, that I uh, didn't actually plan for and I wasn't looking for. <laughs> um, you know, at the end of uh, Psalm 91, uh, it speaks about uh, showing, uh, showing uh, that person who, who abides in the shadow of the Almighty, uh, showing him his Yeshua, showing him his salvation. Uh, and so um, I knew that God had shown me his Yeshua. He had shown me his uh, Jesus, his salvation, his ultimate salvation. Uh, and it was uh, it was deeply impressed upon me to also to share that salvation with my people uh, as well. And so after I uh, finished my military service, I got into uh, got involved in ministry. Uh, and at the beginning, it was uh, mainly evangelism, and it was evangelism through um, through the media, through the internet, uh, through YouTube videos, which back then, this is kind of 2007, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, was really right at the beginning. There was nothing like this uh, in Israel, definitely not in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language. Uh, and so that's where we really started to pioneer these uh, video uh, testimonies of Israelis in Hebrew, sharing about how they, as Jewish Israelis, have found uh, the Jewish Messiah, uh, Yeshua. Uh, and then there were obviously uh, articles and, and other uh, supporting uh, uh, materials around that. Um, and, you know, all, all during that time while I was involved in, in uh, establishing and pioneering those uh, ministries, uh, my wife Karen and I had been uh, deeply uh, involved in our local congregation in Kerem Al uh, ever since it had been founded in 2009 officially. Uh, but it began to meet as a home group of Kamel uh, assemblies or Keirat Kamel uh, already in 2008, right after we got married. Uh, and so... Kind of my wife and I, we always joke that that Caramel was founded, especially for us, because we were really looking for a, a congregation where we could, <clears throat> um, uh, or a congregation that was uh, Hebrew speaking and focused on reaching Israelis. And that really is, has been, ha always has been and still is the focus of, of Caramel, uh, where we serve today. 
Uh, and, and we were involved throughout the years in uh, teaching and discipling and Karen was leading worship and we were part of the leadership team. Uh, but then the need for, for more leaders uh, came. And so I, I felt for, for a number of years that the Lord was uh, calling me uh, to that. But uh, I was trying to, to keep it off uh, for a while there, to be honest. Uh, a bit of a, a, a Jonah, I think, for a while. Um, but, but really, the need was there. And, and I knew that, that the call was on my life. And so I answered that call. Uh, and so to answer your, your question, uh, it is a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge in many ways uh, to pastor in Israel. Uh, it's a challenge uh, spiritually. It's a challenge uh, practically, uh, financially. Uh, it's a lot of work in the trenches with the people. Um, you know, when people come uh, to faith, it, it's, it's natural in a way to get into the Bible stories of the Tanakh, of the Old Testament, which they may be more familiar with from school and, and maybe from, you know, other from just from general uh, the, the feasts and, and just kind of the general culture in Israel. Uh, but it is very, very basic. Many times uh, it, it comes with all of the, the rabbinical baggage that has to be undone uh, actually before you can get back to the to the real uh, truth with them. Um, the body here is is very, very young, and so there's still a, a large lack of uh, spiritually mature people, spiritually mature role models. Uh, in our <coughs> community, uh, we mainly have uh, new believers uh, who need discipling really at, at the most basic of levels. Uh, again, because they have no previous example of understanding of what it means to be a, a believer, a, a follower of, of Messiah. It's very, very foreign uh, to them. So it's a lot of a lot of day to day work with people, just guiding them uh, in all kinds of issues that they have, spiritual issues, uh, personal issues, whatever it may be. Um, but. Uh, it is very rewarding to be able to see <clears throat> people who really come from uh, from these different backgrounds <clears throat> coming back to the land of Israel, and then and then growing in faith uh, in Messiah, uh, and and so it's it's very challenging on the one hand, but really we I know that this is really the core of of uh, what God is doing here in the land. He's bringing the people back to the land, but not only for them to be here, but to reveal Himself to them. Amazing. Uh, and, and do you think that there is an opening now amongst um, uh, Israelis, uh, Jewish Israelis, to the fact that Yeshua is the Messiah? Because before there's been <laughs> such a massive wall of petition. And, and uh, you know, in the early days of the state, if we go back to the uh, late 1940s, when the state was established, there were very, very few Messianic Jewish believers. Uh, and now there are so many of you, thankfully, praise God. So um, are Israeli hearts now beginning to open to the fact that Yeshua is Israel's Messiah. Yeah, I think that there is definitely a lot more of an openness uh, towards that. I think that um, uh, compared to previous years, people are much more willing to listen. Uh, people are more interested. I think there's more awareness about who Messianic believers are in general. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, I say for worse because sometimes there, or in the past, there have been some negative. Uh, there's been negative press about uh, believers. Uh, here, but I think these days, because there are more believers as well, many times <clears throat> people will say that they've met messianic believers either in the military or they had uh, a believer with them in school uh, or they've worked with a believer in the past and in, in the workplace. So it's becoming more and more common for people, uh, for Israelis to meet uh, other believers. Uh, and, and in the vast majority of cases that I've heard of, it, it's a positive impression that they have. And there's, a, there's an interest there about what it is uh, that we believe in. Uh, it turns heads. It still turns heads. People still can't kind of get over exactly what it is that we believe in. Jesus, the Christian, or Yeshua Nutsli, as they call him here in uh, in Hebrew, Jesus, the Christian, he's the Messiah of the Jewish people. Uh, it still doesn't register. Uh, but I think that there definitely is more of an openness, uh, especially from the more secular crowd. Uh, maybe also from the traditional, the, the traditional crowd as well. Uh, obviously, from the uh, orthodox side of things, it's it's still very, very anti as anti as can be, uh, and there's still a lot of opposition coming from uh, their direction, unfortunately. But we know that at some point that will change. 
Absolutely. Well, well you, you're in the front lines, uh, so we really appreciate that and, and certainly giving us a, an understanding of the uh, Messianic Jewish community and what they face in Israel. Mm-hmm. Now, it's uh, pretty much an exciting time to be in Israel right now, isn't it, with everything going on. Um, I, I think your politics has infected our politics because our politics has just become very crazy with the uh, resignation of our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who is, I've got to say... Um, the, the biggest supporter of Israel than any prime minister we've had before, the most pro-Israel cabinet uh, that this government has had really since the cabinet of Lord George during the First World War, who issued the signing of the Balfour Declaration. But enough of British politics. We want to know about Israeli politics. So you have a new prime minister in uh, Yair Lapid. You are on the 1st of November. Uh, it's going to be Israel's fifth election in three and a half years. Could Bibi Netanyahu make a big return and come back to power? And also you've got the US president in town as well, uh, Joe Biden, and his first official visit of the state of Israel as US president. How do you unpack everything that's going on, plus the Iranian nuclear threat that uh, it seems to be getting closer and closer? Um, it's certainly a lot going on in Israel right now. So do you want to unpack some of those big issues that, that Israel is currently facing right now? Yeah, well, there's never a dull uh, moment in the Middle <laughs> East, is there? <laughs> and, there's ne- <laughs> and there's never a dull moment in uh, in Israel. Uh, but yeah, such are the times that we are living in. Um, we we are in the end times. We know that these things are going to be happening uh, more and more. That changes and shifts and and this build up is taking place. Uh, and it's built up towards a birth. It's built up towards the, the return of the king. Uh, and so any kind of build up like that is going to have uh, a lot of uh, tensions and a lot of uh, struggle uh, surrounding it. Uh, and so we see that, I think we see that in, in all of the, the areas that you mentioned. Uh, internally within Israel, there is, there is a, a great divide. Uh, the, the nation is really split down the middle between the, the left and the right. Uh, there are two camps and that that polarization has become clearer over the past few years with the previous four rounds of election. I don't see how it's going to be any different in the in this coming fifth election either, uh, which is very negative for Israel. It's negative for Israel uh, regionally in terms of defense. It's uh, negative for Israel internally in terms of uh, social issues and economically. Uh, it's just not good uh, at all. But the problem is, uh, and here they're even starting to speak about changing the system. I think like they've been speaking about in the UK as well. The system uh, is not working because we can't get to uh, to a point where a decision is made. It's not definitive enough. Uh, and, and so even uh, you're talking about Netanyahu making a comeback. He's running uh, as the head of the Likud. Likud is still going to be the majority party by the looks of it, uh, according to the uh, polls as they stand uh, right now. And it'll probably continue to be like that uh, as well. Uh, I think the the um, uh, segment uh, that that votes right is larger in Israel than the segment that votes uh, left. And uh, and we could have a have a a very large uh, support base. So <clears throat> Likud is definitely going to be the largest party. But the question is, will Netanyahu, if uh, Likud wins and he is given the mandate to try and form a coalition, will he actually be able to do that? And will he be able to form a coalition that will be uh, sustainable uh, and and last as long or longer than the than the current one? Um, he wasn't able to do that the last uh, three rounds uh, of, uh, or actually the last four rounds, because I think he got the opportunity the last round as well. <clears throat> he wasn't able to do that. And so the question is, will he be able to do that uh, now uh, as well? And uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens. Uh, Lapid is kind of a, a newcomer, definitely to the prime minister's uh, office, uh, but he's been in Israeli politics for a while already uh, and held a number of different uh, positions <clears throat> uh, in the government. And so... Uh, he hasn't really been given an opportunity to to show what he can do in terms of leadership skills. Uh, unfortunately, he won't probably be able to show that much uh, of what he can do because he's going to be uh, limited during this time as interim prime minister, just to keep the the ship kind of steady as she goes uh, until election time. Uh, but as we've seen in the past, that election time could go on for a number of rounds even uh, because there's no clear uh, signs of, of the election going one way or the other, going left or going right. So we'll need to wait and see what happens uh, with that. Uh, 
but then obviously that connects in with uh, the the prime minister, the uh, visit from Biden, which is taking place uh, as we speak. Uh, today he finished his second round of uh, meetings with uh, Israeli officials. Tomorrow he'll be meeting with uh, Palestinian officials, and then he's uh, continuing on to Saudi Arabia. And uh, yeah, you know, I think there's it, been a lot of smiles and a lot of positive sentiment from the Americans and from the from Biden the Biden administration uh, on this trip. Um, there are areas of tension, obviously, around the Iranian issue and how exactly to deal with that. Some of them have been actually very uh, vocal and upfront on the uh, on the TV screens as uh, Biden and Lapid <laughs> stood side to side, podium to podium, and kind of in a in a in a nice way. Uh, we're, we're contradicting each other about uh, what uh, needs to be done and the best way to deal with the Iranian threat. So obviously, we don't see the eye to eye, or Israel doesn't see eye to eye with American about uh, with America about how to deal with this issue. There are different interests, but then there are uh, um, uh, overlapping interests as well. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few days with uh, Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia to Jeddah and see what uh, developments take place there. Uh, but I think that all of this is all moving again towards these birth pangs. I think uh, that connects in with uh, COVID, which I think was a very, very significant birth pang that the whole world experienced, not just uh, localized here in the Middle East. Uh, but it's all moving towards these, these birth pangs uh, that we know from Matthew 23 are going to become more frequent. They're going to become, uh, I believe, more intense. Uh, and uh, and that's what we're going to be seeing and experiencing until uh, until uh, it is time uh, for this birth, until it is time for Messiah uh, to return. Yeah. Amen. Um, also, uh, for everyone watching, and, and really appreciate everyone uh, listening to uh, Stefan's uh, not only incredible testimony, uh, testimony, but also his experience of being a pastor in Israel, and also his uh, political knowledge and understanding. So this is your opportunity to put a question in the box for Stefan, uh, and uh, he'll do the best to answer it. Um, you talked about uh, the the birth pangs that that uh, Jesus talks about on the Olivet uh, discourse, uh, which will be the major signs before his return. But where where do you think we are prophetically? Because uh, you know Israel has just celebrated um, her seventy second birthday as a as a nation reborn, um, and that's that's quite a long generation, and so much has happened uh, to Israel over those over those uh, short years as a whole generation um what are your thoughts on where we are pathetically right now yeah so obviously the restoration of <laughs> israel in 1948 uh puts all of us clearly in the in the end times and the end days um for generations people believers had said jesus can return at any at any moment but but there was a, a fundamental failure to understand that one of the basic uh, prerequisites to his return, uh, and that uh, is the the Jewish people back in the land uh, of Israel. Um, then I think also 1967, the reunification of Jerusalem was another milestone in that direction. Uh, and then I would say the other milestone, uh, major one after that, is really the Messianic community, which, like you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Simon, was was just very, very few people, um, maybe a handful of families back in 1948, and now is anywhere, somewhere around 30,000 uh, believers, which is still a very, very small percentage of the population, uh, 0.2 or 0.3 percent, uh, 30,000 out of uh, about 9.2. 2 million, uh, 9.3 million, still a very, very small number, uh, but still a lot of growth um, for these uh, past uh, 74 years uh, since the nation was uh, was reestablished. <clears throat> so these, these, I think, are the milestones. Uh, and then these, these birth pangs that, yeah, Yeshua speaks about in Matthew 24, about nations coming against nations, about pestilences and earthquakes and all kinds of natural disasters taking place. Uh, and these are the things that we see uh, happening. Uh, you know, the Abraham Records Accords uh, that were signed uh, under President uh, Trump, I think, were were very significant. 
uh, and 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 even the you know the the Middle East uh, tensions that 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 will continue to lead to even an even wider uh, peace deal, and, and we may see the first steps of that coming into place even over this coming weekend in the coming uh, days and weeks as. Uh, relations uh, possibly normalized and, and definitely going towards a place of normalization with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and possibly with other nations uh, as well. Um, still, I think that that there is a, a major war on the horizon at some point. I don't know to say exactly when uh, or exactly with who. It, it, it seems logical that it would be something around Iran, Russia, Syria, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, obviously that kind of axis that is working uh, in our region of the world, maybe China, maybe uh, uh, North Korea. Um, but but I think that whatever that that will take place at some point in the future, uh, and then that will usher in a, an even broader and and more significant era of peace or a covenant uh, that we read about in Daniel nine. Um, and and during all of that, uh, it, this this will influence the entire world, obviously. Uh, but Israel will be uh, at the at the center. Israel will be the epicenter. Um, but it will definitely affect the entire world and, and also the body of Messiah uh, around the world. So these things, they're not easy for us to experience. There's a lot of, like I said, tension, uh, uncertainty. Uh, but we know uh, that that we are uh, that God is establishing uh, his kingdom here on earth. We know that we every day that goes by, we are one day closer to the king establishing his kingdom in Jerusalem. Uh, and I think that that's exciting that we can be a part of that. Absolutely. Uh, Stefan, it's also great to see that uh, your, your, your mum and dad also taking part in this in our Zoom event today. So we have uh, Andrew's asked a question. Uh, how many uh, Messianic Jewish believers are there who are members of the Israeli Knesset? So uh, David and uh, Josie Silver answered none at all. But the, uh, the new prime minister's sister in law is the Messianic Jew. There we go. So thanks very much for that one, David. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Uh, that. That's again one of the the challenges of uh, I think of the of the messianic community here in the land is that it, it, we really are a minority, and we have uh, we we are not recognized as an official faith of any kind, uh, and we have no um, uh, 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 representation whatsoever in in the Knesset. So so these again these are some of the struggles and some of the challenges that we deal with as uh, believers here in the land. Um, but uh, we hope that in the future that will change. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, opportunity. We've got another six minutes. So uh, this is your opportunity to put a question to uh, to Stefan on the Middle East or a theological issue and anything you like tonight. So maybe Mark will maybe come up with with uh, with a question. I know he probably will. But I will say one thing I think which is important. What role can Christian Zionists play uh, and supporters of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem United Kingdom play in helping to support the Messianic Jewish community in Israel, which is so important because you are the body of believers in the land. Yeah, so we deeply uh, value uh, the ICJ uh, as, as an organization and obviously all of you who are, who are joining in tonight. Uh, and all of our brothers and sisters around the world who uh, who support the nation of Israel uh, and the Jewish people who support uh, Aliyah and Jewish immigration, who support the, Ju the Messianic Jewish community uh, in the land. Um, you probably know as well that there are unfortunately many Christian organizations uh, around the world who support Israel, but shy away from supporting the Messianic Jewish community uh, in the land. And I personally believe that supporting the Messianic Jewish community in the land should come before supporting the nation of Israel uh, as a whole. Uh, uh, I think that that is, that is more important uh, than the other. Uh, because by doing uh, by supporting the messianic jewish community you, you are doing both you are supporting the messianic jewish community and you are supporting israel um but when it goes just to israel and then completely shying away from the messianic jewish community uh then that unfortunately strengthens uh the the anti-messianic uh organizations that operate here in the land uh that are very uh active in in trying to um uh, to shut down any kind of messianic uh, uh congregations uh, any kind of uh, uh evangelism activity or, or anything like that um 
So just to say that we are very appreciative of you all and of ICJ and of organizations who are uh, very open in their stand and support for Israel and also for the Messianic Jewish community. <clears throat> and I would say, uh, yeah, to, to to continue praying. I know that you pray uh, daily, even uh, maybe sometimes uh, uh, a number of times a day, uh, individually, in groups, on Zoom, uh, physical meetings. Uh, praying for Israel and for the Messianic Jewish community. Uh, and I, I hope that some of the things that I shared tonight uh, can be some additional uh, prayer points for you to pray into uh, about uh, or for the, the for Israel, for the Messianic Jewish community uh, here in the land. Um, again, probably like many of you are already uh, aware of and doing, which is coming alongside the Messianic Jewish community with uh, encouragement, with uh, finances, with practical aid. Uh, you know, just for us to, uh, we have uh, our own, uh, uh, or we have supporters, people that are connected with us, partnering with us in the work that we're doing. Uh, and we get emails from people, people write us prayer emails, just a prayer that they've prayed. It can be a paragraph. Sometimes we get some really long ones, <laughs> but but they're really amazing to read. Uh, and, and, and sometimes there are insights in there and, and you can just see how God has spoken to that person and, and showed them what to pray for, even without us mentioning. Uh, and then it just comes as a very, very deep, strong encouragement uh, for us. Uh, people who write us uh, emails of encouragement, even just one line is thinking of you, praying for, for you, keep up the good work. These are things that, that are like uh, lifelines for us. It's like air, it's like oxygen uh, for us that helps us to continue doing the work uh, that we need to do. Uh, and so that encouragement, obviously, along with practical uh, support and aid, uh, I think is very, very vital uh, for helping the, the, the local community here continue to grow, continue to, um, to mature uh, and to continue to, to grow strong. Uh, and then uh, I think locally, because uh, obviously most of you cannot have a, a direct effect on or, or involvement in what is going on here on the ground. Uh, but you can be rallying others around you. Uh, and I would say, uh, first and foremost, within your local uh, church, uh, especially if, it's, if it is a, a less uh, pro-Israel church, uh, and then and then to other uh, uh, people uh, outside of that, um, to friends, to neighbors, to family members, to your local government representatives, uh, and really uh, encouraging everyone to fulfill the roles of Romans 11, uh, to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy, uh, and also Romans 15 to to come alongside uh, the messianic uh, community uh, and to help in in whichever way is possible. So those those I would say are, are some of the you know the more practical ways uh, that you could help. And uh, and I know that you are already doing it, and I would encourage you to continue to do that and to bring as many people with you as you can. Because really, when the when the church around the world is is able to unify around this uh, this issue and really stand up and take a stand. I think that we would we would see a, a very different uh, reality uh, than what we see uh, today in, in many many regards, and so we hope uh, absolutely. that they, they... Um, uh, David's answered this question again. Uh, so I know that we have to get David on um, very very soon on uh, our Jerusalem Dispatch uh, Zoom event. Uh, so Jennifer writes: uh, What percentage of the population are Messianic believers in the land? So David uh, has responded point. 0.2 percent uh which also you said that as well was extremely low did you say thirty thousand? it's yeah it's 0.3 percent not 0.02 percent it's zero it's one third of one percent well oh, absolutely yeah. tiny um it's been absolutely inspirational tonight um stefan uh, and i thoroughly enjoyed it and i'm sure a lot of our viewers have but before i go i have to read out this one from phil um because uh, he's a good friend of mine but he says this he says hi uh, stefan never met you but remember too well your involvement in the second lebanon war and would like to thank you for your selflessness as you fought for your land and kept that tide of evil from uh, our shores. Uh, blessings to your wife, children, brother, mam, and dad. And that's from Phil and uh, Brent in uh, in Wales. Also, he phoned me before we started this uh, event by saying that he was actually in your father's house while you were fighting in southern Lebanon. And uh, he remembers the, uh, the, the rockets flying over and going into the bomb shelters. But he did say that you were speaking to your mum and... Uh, uh, and you were saying you only had 15 seconds to get to, into a tank when these Hezbollah rockets were flying over. 
and your mum Josie said, "No, you have to get there in 14 seconds." Um, <laughs> so we're so you've got great parents, and uh, you know you, you're all doing fantastic work. But I'm just going to pass over to Reverend uh, Mark Starbuck to to sum up tonight. Uh, and it's been an absolute delight to have you as our special guest for this month, Stefan. Thank you. Thank Did you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. It's been a joy just to listen and uh, get a window into what's happening in your life and has happened. And of course, we know that the best is yet to come. Amen. Um, our, our God leads us uh, into a greater, greater release of his glory and his grace and his blessing. And so thank you so much for sharing with us. We look forward to seeing you again. And uh, who knows, maybe at the feast sometime, um, it would be great to have you and see you there. So let's just pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you that we are joined in our love of Christ the Savior and our service of the King and the kingdom. And we do pray that wherever we are, whether it's in Israel here in the UK, South Africa, America, that, Lord, you will cause your church to fully understand the significance and the importance of your ancient covenant people. Would you bless the work of Pastor Stephen and the church? And, Lord, would you just strengthen the hand of all Israel-related ministries? We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much. Pleasure. I, and I want to just say special thanks uh, to uh, Joanne, who hasn't been feeling very well, uh, and yet she put all of tonight's uh, together, all the marketing, the flyers, sent out all the emails. So thank you so much, uh, Joanne, and great job, Mark, as well. And uh, thank you for Stefan for being our, our, our special guest. So, uh, Lila Tov, it's a uh, good night from us. And thank you so much for joining us for this live edition of Jerusalem Dispatch ICJ UK. So please continue to support the ministry, get involved, pray for the ministry, and also uh, share this uh, great testimony that that uh, Stephen shared on your social media platforms because this will be uploaded to the ICJ UK YouTube uh, channel. So I want to thank you for watching tonight's Jerusalem Dispatch. Shalom and God bless.